and welcome to the Hacking State Podcast. This is your host, Alex Mershak. With me today is uh, my good friend, population geneticist, popular on Substack, popular on Twitter, Razib Khan. Welcome to the show. What's up, Alex? Hey, man. How's it going? It's going. It's going. It's a uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, chill weekend. Good. Excellent. Um, so it's been a while since we uh, last talked, at least uh, in an official capacity online. Uh, you know, you and I know each other in real life. And so we've had plenty of interactions uh, outside of that. Um, but I thought I'd bring, you know, my audience sort of up to date with things that are going on with you. Obviously, you're a well-known and popular figure among certain parts of the Internet, uh, as well as elsewhere, you know, in the scientific and certain historical communities. Um, but maybe not everybody's totally aware of everything that you're doing. And so I thought we'd talk a little bit today about um, some of your work, obviously, in population genetics, which is what you're most well known for, uh, as well as what's been going on just lately um, with kind of your your burgeoning, I feel like your burgeoning internet <laughs> personality. I mean, you've been, an, you've been a, a presence in the online world for a very long time, but I feel like for some reason in the last like year or so, uh, you've really started to move into like a much higher direction. And I'm actually very interested in seeing where you'll end up um, maybe another could, year I, from now. I could end up what wherever, whatever. Yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> and um, and also just like, you know, taking the opportunity to ask you some questions that I don't normally get to ask you. I mean, we are friends in real life, but there are some things that it's just a little bit uh, odd for me to be asking you, but uh, on a podcast, I can ask you. Um, and by that, I just mean... Bro, bro, let's just like cut this chase. I'm not interested. No, <laughs> yeah. By that, I just mean, uh, you know, particular questions about like your worldview and what you think, how you understand yourself. So to get started, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your self-understanding within the ecosystem of uh of i guess genetics and science more broadly um in some ways you are a a popularizer of science um but i wanted to ask you a little bit about like how you conceptualize your own personal project in terms of your contributions to population genetics and its relationship to history yeah i mean i think um i think of myself as a node you know Okay. So yeah, I mean, obviously a popularizer, but uh, I also have connections to say the cognitive genomics communities. Um, I have connections to the population genomics communities, uh, stat genetics, human genetics, evolutionary genetics, evolutionary biology to some extent. Um, so I, I I try to be broad and um, pretty, uh, you know, like I guess the word I would say is latitudinarian. I'm interested in a lot of these topics. And uh, I'm not very narrow in my focus on that, although uh, my training um, and my um, kind of like professional focus is, excuse me, evolutionary population genomics and population genomics in particular. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, people have probably seen my PCA plots or admixture plots and all these other things. And I've done work for these direct genomics, uh, direct uh, personal genomics companies. You know, I've done work for them. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, with Family Tree DNA and National Geographic, some of my work has actually, <clears throat> you know, gotten in front of millions of consumers, you know. So, um, you know, I think I've had an influence there. You know, there are geneticists, you know, who are faculty members who've told me they learned how to do ad admixture analysis through my, <laughs> through my tutorials. Sorry. Um, I I'm on the West Coast right now. There's smoke. So mm. I'm just going to tell Tell the audience. And it's, a, it's a dystopian hellscape out there. Well, okay. Pacific <laughs> Northwest. Pacific Northwest is fiery, and Southern California has a hurricane. So that's all. Yeah. So, so you are, uh, I guess, a very important node. Um, one of the things you tweeted out earlier today was that a a question that you've gotten from people is how long you think you can exhaustively continue to write on different populations around the world. Um, and obviously, you know, I'm not sure how much of this uh, you, you saw coming or whether it's just a fortunate circumstance, but you happen to be in a field where a lot of uh, data has been unlocked thanks to sort of 
the computing revolution and advances in chips and the ability to process and store large amounts of data. Um, and this has been very beneficial to the field because now there's a tremendous amount of new information that we did not have before about human genetics and about the history of human populations. Um, so given that access to new data, I wanted to ask you, like, what are the populations that you personally find the most interesting? So uh, most of the listeners who know, or listeners and viewers who know my stuff, I'm super interested in the Eurasian step uh, because, uh, so if you're gonna do ancient DNA and population genetics to understand historical questions, all right, all right understand the history of the Romans. Like that is interesting, but there is a history of the Romans. So you have archeologists, you have textual analysis, you have the Romans themselves <laughs> telling their own history. This is not a really thing with the Eurasian step people. They have some oral, you know, history. That's often pretty, you know, okay, like, what do you do with, like, the Turks telling you that they're descended from wolves, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, you don't really have um, this normal history that you'd find in Thucydides, Herodotus, or, you know, Summa Shen or something like these, your Chinese analysts. Um, so you start out with um, a lot less, and so genetics can step into the breach, uh, giving you a general sense. So, for example, <clears throat> there are arguments about where the Turks are coming from. Um, you know, it's called the Altaic language family because the assumption is from the Altai, but there's all sorts of disagreements, you know, and uh, some people will tell you <laughs> maybe they're from further west or maybe they're from further east, south, north, in Siberia. Well, with ancient DNA, you can look at the early Turks. You can look at the Turkish royal family like the Ashina dynasty uh, 1500 years ago. You see where they're related. They're from Western Mongolia. Hmm. So they're, they're, they're actually from, this is one case where the oral history and the inferences you can make from looking at the language distributions and where the Turks start showing up in historical records, because they show up in the records of their enemies. And so <clears throat> with these sorts of <clears throat> oral history people, you can like, get a peg on them and calibrate them through the people that they encounter. So you have kind of an outline of where they are. But within that outline, <clears throat> in, in the interior, you'd be dragons, right? Mm. Until we had ancient DNA and we had demography, we can look at families, we can look at relatedness. <clears throat> you know, there are arguments um, about the early Indo-Europeans. Well, now we have samples from um, Hungary and Mongolia that are second cousins. So we know that they were spreading as family groups in two directions across one end of Eurasia to the other end of Eurasia along the Eurasian steppe, right? Mm. So that's not an argument, like they're second cousins. You know, so these are the sort of questions that can be answered. Um, is the Rurikid royal family a real royal family? You know, the Russian royal family of which the Romanovs are a branch, there are a lot of them. Yeah, because they share the same Y chromosome lineage. Mm -hmm. Like these are questions that can be answered and falsified or justified like pretty simply now. And what do you understand to be the primary like implications of getting to the answers of these questions? I mean, besides people's curiosities, obviously a lot of people are curious about their own personal lineages or various myths or things like that that are claimed about their background or where their people came from or how they got to where they are. Um but do you think there are like broader, um, I guess, civilizational or societal implications to getting to the bottom of some of these questions? Yeah, I mean, um, like we pretty much know now that, uh, you know, it's not a question of whether human society is patriarchal, it's how patriarchal. So there's some that lend towards some sort of gender egalitarianism, more or less. And then there's like, you know, the Saudi extreme. And most societies are between the two. There's no real matriarchal societies where women rule. <clears throat> you could say, like, oh, we knew this from first principles because of physical strength, but now we know from DNA, we can see that these, like, male paternal lineages explode periodically with harems and all these other things. Um, in terms of war, uh, well, I mean, we can see it had an impact. So, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you know, there's arguments about, okay, like, <clears throat> spread of agriculture was was peaceful and people imitated their neighbors you know like globalization or something spread of english i don't know uh, although spread of english was highly demographic too 
we know that's not true. It's all it's almost all demographic now. There's mm. some exceptions, but the spread of agriculture was due to the expansion of the people. Um, perhaps they just demographically overwhelmed the other people, but also from what we can see in the archaeology and the historical record, like comparing it to other areas, it looks like they probably just like killed and absorbed the indigenous people. You know? <clears throat> so um, the last like 500 years, the conquistadors, not exceptional. That's the, that's the typical type of thing. Uh, there are Indo-Europeanists uh, in Denmark who are actually reaching out to Latin American scholars of the conquistador age, and they want to have like a joint conference because they want to understand how the conquistadors hispanicized, you know, the Spaniard. Well, also, you know, obviously in Brazil, similar mm. case, but Latinized. All the Latin, yeah, Latinized Latin America, right? Mm. Uh, because it looks like the Indo-Europeanization of Northern Europe is a very similar process <laughs> where um, there were mostly men. They brought some women, but not enough. And they intermarried with the local indigenous Neolithic women. And, uh, you know, so in German, um, the word for lady, the word lady is not an Indo-European root. So that's indicative that it was probably like a native Neolithic word. And these Indo-European men just used the Neolithic word because their wives tended to be natives. Mm -hmm. uh, with the words for many agricultural things, cultivation, are not Indo-European. So okay. they figured it out from the local farmers. And it gets to the point where you can see uh, men that are buried in a village that are all related to each other, so it's a paternal lineage, and you see evidence of violence where the arrowheads in their heads are literally arrowheads that are made particularly by Neolithic men. Mm. So the local men did resist, and they did kill some of the Indo-Europeans. So this is basically like just like standard stuff that you would predict from the Spanish conquest of the New World or the Mongols and stuff like that. This, is, this has been happening for 10,000 years. Hmm. And what is the relationship then between this sort of this field, which has exploded in prominence and, you know, really just uh, sheer processing power in especially the last 30 years and other uh, older, uh, maybe less quantitative fields like uh, archaeology or philology? How are those intentioned? Yeah. Yeah. Um let's like set up the framework for what's happening in these historical population genetics uh, studies of the last, let's say 12 years, 13 years, since about 2010. Uh, let's like date it to the Neanderthal genome, the Denisovan genome of 2010, all there's stuff earlier, a little bit. <clears throat> there was, okay, there was a <coughs> knock, knock in Greenland, that's the Willer Sledge group, so right before. All right, so what's happening is co compute is going up exponentially. We, everyone knows this. Mm -hmm. All the techies know this. Regular people know this. Okay, so that helps. <clears throat> the sequencing technology itself is getting better. So shotgun sequencing, next generation sequencing, <coughs> etc. So the biological data generation framework is getting better. This is producing all this data. The data is being caught by the compute. So it's like that's one step, right? Um, and this is affecting... <coughs> human genomics, medical genomics, everything like that. But uh, how does it reply to, to, to the, what we're talking about now? Ancient DNA is a separate field. And that started in the 1980s, 1990s. Forensics is associated with it. And they got better and better at figuring out how to extract degraded DNA, old DNA, damaged DNA. They figured out empirically the patterns of damage. So uh, you can tell if it's contamination from one of your lab workers because uh, it's not damaged in the way you expect it to be damaged. Mm. But this is only like, this is only something you can figure out empirically through trial and error, through experience. So it took decades. So now they can tell apart the old from the new. <clears throat> Another thing is they know the patterns of damage and they have computer, computer um, horsepower to actually like filter, reconstruct, like, a, <clears throat> like, um, you know, flip, filter out these mutations and things like that. And um, so everything kind of hangs together, you know, is mm. what I would say. Everything hangs together synchronously. Um, the ancient DNA revolution was not anticipated and was not related in any necessary way um, to the rise of genomics. But they kind of emerged simultaneously, hooked together, <coughs> and synergistically, <coughs> excuse me, uh, synergistically, there's a new field. So... We had one human genome 20 years ago. Mm. Now we have thousands of ancient genomes. 
So, ancients. Like, we have probably millions of regular modern genomes, humans, right? Sure. We have thousands of ancient genomes. So think about that. We had one human genome in the year 2000 draft. Mm. 2023, we have thousands of ancient genomes. If you count genotypes, um, I think it's like tens of thousands. Right? In terms of, like, the stuff you get from 23 me. Right. Hundreds of thousands of markers, right? So, obviously, without computers, you can't figure anything out out of this. Mm. You learn a haystack. So computers can um, process the data, extract, you know, signal out of a noise. You know, we know about machine learning and all these other things. And uh, so that's necessary. So you can have data, but if you can't do anything with it, you know. Hmm. And did that end up uh, working in concert with or upending some of the claims of uh, like paleo or archaeologists or philologists? So I would say um, the archaeologists, like, no offense, uh, were hosed more mm. um, uh, because they had all these theories. And archaeology had a lot of data. It's physical science to some extent. But um, like history, it's weak on theory. Okay? Um, and they had theories of continuity. And uh, in places like concrete example, I read a paper, this guy had spent his his whole career <clears throat> figuring out that actually the corded wear people <coughs> of um, the East Baltic are mm. descended from hunter gatherers because of all this stuff, looking at the pots and how they evolved and all this. Um, uh, excuse me, uh, child interrupt. Um, but uh, so, um, the genetics show up, and they show within like one to two generations. There's like the people are killed. Mm. Okay, um, and so he has to have a rebuttal where he's trying to figure out how the geneticists are wrong. But this is not like tentative. Like these are different people. Mm. Okay, they're like genetically as different as. Spaniards are from. <clears throat> I'm trying to give an example. Sami. Like a laps. Yeah. Okay. They're like very, very distinct. Like this is not where, oh, you know, no, 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 no. It jumps out of the data. Okay. There, it was a genetic replacement. Now, there was some assimilation of women. Mm. And so <clears throat> it turns out what, what this guy saw. The, the the step people they came with baskets that didn't have pots because pots don't travel well they crack they break yeah and so what happened is the men were like you know we want I guess we got pots now but they're like we like the whole basket look so these local farmer women took the basket patterns integrated it into their pottery making hmm. so there was there was some continuity they were farmers they were not hunter gatherers by the way but. There was some continuity. So the archaeologists weren't making things. They just misinterpreted it. Mm. Right? And so they didn't have the right theory. Yeah. So <clears throat> it's a common problem. And um, a lot of them are quite butthurt about it. And they often, um, like, I'm being candid here because I don't think they're going to be watching your podcast. Because um, Not too I'd many archaeologists bit, are watching my but, show. I mean, I, I mean, like, some of them are super into it, but some of them are, like, really butthurt. Mm. And, you know, they'll be like, oh, that's a really bold claim to make. How can you make it? And I'm just like, uh, it literally takes like two minutes to run on my computer. Yeah. And they're like, well, how are you sure? And I'm like, uh, look, I have 100,000 data points in those markers. Mm. It's a lot of data points. Like you have like, <clears throat> like you can do archaeological analysis of the pottery and other things. Like, oh, you have like 27 landmarks. Yeah. You get 27 markers. Mm. I got 100,000 markers. Right? I'm sorry. So, you know, they're they're coming along. But, um, you know, some people, they've built their whole career on a theory that was falsified by these geneticists that just show up. Mm. You know, although they are working with archaeologists now, they're integrating with archaeologists, they're trying to play nice. So I don't want to overemphasize it. But, you know, uh, they're, you know they're, this is like biological imperialism. Yeah. The imperial, imperialism of biologists and statisticians that are coming in 
to this field that is like rich in data, but the data is not organized by a very robust theory, you know? Mm -hmm. So archaeologists had all these little theories and they're not well integrated. There's no theory of anything. Um, I think the cultural evolution people actually might provide that at some point. But um, right now it's a hodgepodge that's being shot down or propped up by geneticists. I mean, that's the easiest way I'm going to say it, you know, um, because geneticists have a lot of data to work with <coughs> and powerful methods. Um, like genealogical relationships are not a debate. They're not an argument. They're not an interpretation. Mm -hmm. They're there in the data. And if someone is a sibling, they're a sibling. Yeah. So going a little bit further forward in time, um, you said that the philologists might be a little bit better off. And I'm assuming that has to do with the way that language spreads as opposed to cultural artifacts. Yeah, um, I think so. Um, well, I mean, the issue with cultural artifacts is like you can have like an artisan cast mm -hmm. that spreads the artifact across like many cultural zones, right? So like cuneiform. Yeah. Cuneiform spread, or actually our alphabet, originally, yeah, sure. a, originally a Canaanite alphabet that went to Greece. The Greeks spread it to the uh, to Italy, to the Etruscans. The Etruscan alphabet is copied by the Latins, and now the Latin alphabet is what we're using, right? Mm. Um, this is not the spread of a people. It's the spread of a meme, right? Um, language is a little bit more difficult to spread like that. It obviously can happen. But it often tends to be mediated by human migration, too, sometimes quite substantial. So we just talked about the spread of English. Obviously, I have no English ancestry. You have some English ancestry. Yeah, but sure. you're not actually majority English. We both as far as English. I know. Yeah. Yeah. But so you have uh, – anyway, <clears throat> so the point here is obviously there's a lot of people like us. But um, if you read uh, David Bellish, I think it's David Bellish, uh, the Anglo – David Bellish, Replenishing the World. And like, I'm, let me, I, I want to see if it's uh, Replenishing the Earth, James Bellish. So he is, he himself is Croatian, ethnically, but English, uh, British. Um, he talks about basically uh, settler revolution and the rise of the Anglo world. Uh, the, the demographic expansion of the English people, English speaking people over the last 500 years is crazy. Okay, like compared to how many French well, French people, I mean, they didn't really speak French, but whatever. Like within the Kingdom of France in 1500, there was, it was like three, four, five times more, more people mm. um, than uh, otherwise, right? Um, so um, the, it, that was like a demographic increase. Uh, you know, we know this in England, obviously, but England overflowed into the United States. So there were like 30,000 Puritans, 1630. Uh, by the revolution, there were 250,000. Mm. Okay. And uh, I think 250,000. Yes. And that was all through natural increase in 150 years. None of that was really immigration because there was actually a uh, reverse migration back to England during Cromwell's period. And then also some of the 18th century. Anyway, um, the point is this language, the spread of English is substantially demographic, even if it's also meme. meme um, you know, so when the philologists, the philologists study of ancient languages, you know, they're like, it's always like Nietzsche was a philologist, philologist right? Right. Probably the most famous philologist. So you study ancient languages, you study words, you study connections. Um, it emerges out of the observation that Sanskrit, Latin, and Greek seem somewhat similar, Indo-European languages, Indo-Germanic languages, whatever word you want to use for them. <clears throat> and so they're figuring out how the languages are related to each other. But in the 19th century, philology didn't have you know, they didn't have statistics, they didn't have computational linguistics. They kind of had to eyeball it a little bit, you know? Mm. And so, as human beings, I think they took in other historical and archaeological cues, and kind of, I mean, if I want to say it, like, in modern language, they were a bit Bayesian. Yeah. And so they actually kind of came to the right conclusions. Now, what started ha what started happening in the last, like, 30 years, last really last 20 years, is uh, they've become less Bayesian, like, there's a group called computational linguistics where they take in vocabularies. They put it into phylogenetic, phylogenetic uh, inference programs that normally use genes. Mm -hmm. And uh, candidly, they produce interesting but weird and sometimes non, non, nonsensical results 
because they're basically in programs like they often use beast. So there's a anyway, there's a paper out on Indo Europeans recently, and it produced a result that was weird where Indo Europeans are from Anatolia, like way older, blah blah blah. I don't want to get into it, but basically it's quite clear um, that this is a case where it's not like this is this is like um, computers have not caught up to the 19th century philologists as Bayesian computers, computation algorithms. And that's partly, I think, because language is much more plastic and there's more degrees of freedom mm. uh, than genes, right? With right. genes, like, like my children are, well, they are about, you know, 40, 45% South Asian, a little bit East Asian for me as well, and then like half Northern European. And that's just like a fact. Because that's genes, half, half. You know, Mendel's Law segregation. But culturally, um, they have no very little South Asian connection, you know, mm. like language, religion, um, even food, names, like except for my surname, you know? Right. But, so that's asymmetric transfer because like cultural evolution is much more flexible. Okay. Um, so I think, I think um, you know, our modern day, you know, I mean, this is just obvious if you look at the results. Our Bayesian models in computers cannot capture the subtlety of all the different variables. And so they produce whack results hmm. that do not actually match what philologists uh, said. And it turned out that the geneticists came along and they're like, oh, our match, our results are closer to the philologists and the historical linguists yeah. than they are to the computational linguistics of today. And that's because I believe <clears throat> the philologists are getting closer to the truth because they're humans. And so they make, you know, kind of like fuzzy intuitive leaps that the computers cannot make yet so yeah yeah i mean there's also like a way in which they're like the doing the spread of language in reverse i feel like makes more sense to a human because humans do it going forward um and like it's it's probably quite difficult i mean maybe some of the llms are going to get there soon but it's probably quite difficult for a machine to sort out how a language might evolve uh whereas we you know even within uh yeah. the span of a generation or less watch our own language evolve all the time and adapt to it in real time so um i wanted to ask you a little bit about some questions that i got i talked to some of my friends um the last uh population that's left on clubhouse um they're they're gonna go extinct very soon but um, before they go extinct, I wanted to just, you know, preserve some other questions for you and, uh, you know, enshrine them forever on this broadcast. So um, I got some questions from some of these people. Um, Look, you know, a lot of people don't know what Clubhouse is. OK, so Clubhouse is a social audio app. Uh, it was popular like two years ago, basically during the pandemic. It exploded. Um, it's basically like Twitter spaces and uh, except much higher quality uh tech in my opinion but uh it's dying because they never found a way to monetize it and uh so there's a, a dwindling population of clubhouse users and uh there's no basically no net my net immigration to clubhouse uh so they're going extinct soon but i talked to some of the people on here who know me and who know you and they had some questions for you so i'm going to ask you some of those questions now um one of the consequences moving away from um ancient genetics moving up to modern day genomics is one of the consequences of uh changing fertility rates fertility is a big topic uh both online and online discourse as well um as in you know in for for demographers and even for economists now because of the changes in fertility seem to be global and no one really knows what to do about that um is does delaying fertility, i.e. having children later, have a significant effect on the genetic quality of offspring, and could it have a, an effect at a population level? Um, it depends on how delayed. Um, so I guess you're talking about like quality of offspring. Um, if you don't delay that much, I don't know. If you're in your early 30s, I don't worry. If you're in your mid-30s, it's probably not a big issue. Once you get to the 40s, yeah, there's some issue. Um, I don't think it's gonna. It's not gonna be a, a heritable issue though, because <laughs> um, for at least from the women's side, uh, like so Down syndrome, other things are subfertile. They don't really reproduce. Mm -hmm. um, um, 
there is an issue with the males, where there probably is some mutations that's going into the system. Um, you know, bipolar, schizo, those tend to increase, and it could be just mutations in the male sperm. The linear increase gradual over time, so um, don't wait too long. I mean, I waited. Yeah, my kids are okay. Sort of. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so yeah, it's mostly on the male side, and it it can build up over <laughs> over time, but <laughs> the effect is modest. Yeah, I, I guess the other issue is that I think it would only really be a problem for a whole population if somehow the fertility of older, um, the fertility of people who have children at an older age were higher than the fertility of people that have children at a younger age, which is just unlikely for all yeah, kinds it's of not, it's, it's, Yeah, it's not true. I mean, um, you know, 50% of uh, children... Uh, children children who are born are born to mothers on Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So it's not socioeconomically equally distributed. Like right. I have three kids uh, for my <coughs> socioeconomic class. I have a, a fair number of children, so I'm exceptional. Sure. Um, and uh, another question that they had was, does the genetic diversity of, uh, of the partner uh, matter? for the outcome of the children. I think this is more along the lines of like theories about uh, like hybrid vigor and, um, you know. Uh, what really matters is the match between the two or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. The genetic diversity of the partner matters for the partner, but all that matters in relation to the offspring is what the, <clears throat> so um, if someone is, if they're two inbred people, I don't know, someone's like, Amish, and then somebody else. I'm going to think about another inbred population. Um, Roma. Sure. Okay? Uh, they're both inbred. Okay? If they cross, all of the inbreeding disappears in one generation. Because they have different recessive alleles. Right? So mm. that's, that's the answer to that. So yeah, genetic diversity of the partner only matters in relation to your genetic diversity. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Um, and then I think there was a study out uh, or something like that uh, that I saw posted from a friend of ours, a mutual friend that uh, was it, I believe it's Sweden. I think Sweden now has an interesting thing going on with their fertility where they've managed to get uh, high socioeconomic women to have higher fertility than lower socioeconomic women, which is unusual yeah. as a pattern. I haven't dug into that. I know what, what you're talking about. Um, it could be that eventually we go through some sort of cultural slash biological transition, you know? Mm. Because if uh, all the people that don't want children don't have children, then future generations are going to be from the people who wanted children. Right? Yes. So eventually those means and genes are just mm. going to tautologically win out. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. And so you might you might see some weird patterns over the long term. Sure, sure. I guess uh, yeah, I guess the question was like maybe whether there was something culturally or in terms of policy that they had going on, but I mean, they've been trying to like incentivize uh fertility for a while. It seems like the biggest effect on fertility now hmm. is actually like elite cultural norms and city borders. So for example, I mean, I think France's fertility has dropped again, but France they were doing subsidies for a while and they ha are starting to reduce them just for actually financial reasons. But the big thing in France is there was a cultural norm of elite people who also had a lot of children. Like, you know, like I think like Sigourney Royale, the socialist candidate in 2008, like whatever she lost, but she had like four kids. Mm. That's very exceptional for left wing politician females in the United States. Four kids. Yeah. Well, so I guess moving forward um, in the realm of like topics in fertility and reproduction, a lot of the people, again, that we talk to, maybe it's just a product of our age and our sort of overlapping interests, are interested in questions of reproduction and fertility. And another area that's sort of related to this that could be informed a lot by genetics is... Um, is fertility treatments and fertility and, and and genomic screening, right? Um, so obviously, 
we've talked a lot and people are already doing a lot to reduce the downsides of certain hereditary disorders and diseases. Um, but I think the real, you know, the gain and sort of the hopeful promise of the people that are interested in these topics is that we can actually start creating a lot more upside in terms of, um, you know, human well-being and human performance. Are you hopeful about uh, the field of like, you know, not just genetic screening, but also gene editing and things like that to produce better humans, for lack of a better term? Yeah, okay. So there's, there's two issues in the short term. Um, they're working on curing cystic fibrosis within the next 10 years mm. and curing ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. And the reason they can do that is they know the genes, they know the markers. There's only like one, there's only one genetic position, like locus, that they're targeting. Mm -hmm. So it's a narrow engineering target, right? <clears throat> what they want to do is deliver it through some vector, probably virus, I don't know, um, for cystic fibrosis to the lung and uh, restore function. So the, those cures, gene editing, that's going to happen in the next decade, okay? They're in trials. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think the dogs, they try the dogs because dogs have big lungs, you know, for mammals. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is screening. So screening is already happening. Um, you know, we know for pre non-invasive prenatal for Down syndrome, a lot of you know fetuses are being terminated, aborted, babies are being killed, whatever you want to say. Um, that's already happening, but that's not a heritable thing. What really I think will start happening is we are going to cure um, Mendelian diseases, right? Uh, we'll do it through screening. Uh, with the embryos, uh, and we'll also do it through gene editing. Mm -hmm. ALS and cystic fibrosis are Mendelian diseases. They're just really severe. So they're going first. But we're going to talk about like type 1 diabetes, all of these other things. Like type 1 diabetes, like your life expectancy, I think, is like <laughs> five years less than average. So it's not a big deal, quote unquote. You yeah. know? So they're not going to hit it first. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> Eventually, we will cure type one diabetes. Yeah, because it's, it's usually a it's usually a single gene mutation somewhere. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll figure it out at birth. They'll cure it in the people who have it through gene editing. And you know, I, I think it's almost always. Well, not, I don't want to say. <clears throat> I don't know for sure, but I think a lot of the times it is. Um, I should look it up right now. It, it's a it's a de novo mutation. It's not in the family. Mm -hmm. Obviously, people <laughs> people with the mutation will do screening, but so we're gonna have to do fixing and screening. Right, right. But so 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 there'll be two different methods for getting, uh, I guess, healthier people, um, and ultimately that will just like get rid of a lot of like unnecessary, you know, human misery and suffering that happens, and hopefully we can live better and healthier um well, i mean we'll be better looking healthier yeah because like a lot of it is uh fitness drag on the bottom end for everything. okay yeah yeah so actually i want to ask you a question about that like obviously in 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 in, in evolution there are trade-offs really all over the place and my like naive intuition is that it's very hard to tweak one thing without getting a counter reaction somewhere else that is you know opposite and equal forces, right? So uh, when you say something like, you know, we can basically make people as a base, like like when you say like a lot of it is like digging out the bottom end, um, is there some sort of like, sort of like a ideal genetic optima that you sort of have pre-programmed into your genes? And then it's just a matter of what environments, like what environmental like, damage or bombardment happens yeah. that results you to results in you being less than you might otherwise be yeah this, this is a complicated question when comp with answer is like a little bit complicated it's a little subtle so there's like several classes so i think i'm gonna have to look this up again um but um i think there's like 30 new mutations per person uh that are new to you but you're also getting um uh, uh mutations um let me just check on chat gpt mm -hmm. It's like the, the literature keeps changing. Uh, but there's also mutations that you inherit from your parents. Uh, mutations are done in reference to um, the ancestral or the reference type, you know, the human. So, you know, the rule of thumb 
<clears throat> is the dominant allele, the dominant genetic variant in the population is the non-broken one, mm. right? The non-mutant one. Um, but, uh, you know, um, okay, so, uh, so ChatGPT 4.0 is saying <clears throat> we have 50 to 100. So there's variants. Some people have more, some people have less. Yeah. And by default, most mutations are going to be benign or detrimental. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that's almost all cases. There's very few cases otherwise. Um, but there are cases where, so for example, uh, if you live in Kenya, mutations to light skin is bad. Mm. But in the Northern Hemisphere, it looks like it gets good when you go far enough north, right? <clears throat> so mutations can go from bad to good, depending on the social, on the context, okay? Uh, <clears throat> But um, in general, most mutations are deleterious. They're a fitness drag. A lot of them are recessive, so they drag your fitness down by like 1% or mm. less, you know? So you have a mutation, you have two gene copies, one normal, one mutant, and you're 99% as fit as you would be otherwise. Actually, not 99%. Like, let's say the gene function is 99%. Because you have a co compensating um, good allele, but mm. the point the point here is um, the point here is uh, you have all of these recessives floating around that really don't have much of an effect. It's a little bit of an effect, and so you imagine you're 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 down from your peak. So uh, you know in in a in like a Gattaca utopia, you know fiat power world, you can imagine that you could sweep through your genome and remove all of those bad recessives. So the dream would be you sweep, you get all the bad recessives and it's like hoovering up nickels uh, mm -hmm. that like some of these hedge funds do or like pennies. You get enough and you make a big impact because the recessives are dragging us down subtly, individually, but in the aggregate, we are far below where we are. That's the theory, you know? Mm, okay. <laughs> so imagine, yeah. imagine, imagine you don't have all the recessives that you inherited from your ancestors. Mm. Like they're not bad enough to kill you. You function fine, or maybe they make you a little more ugly, a little yeah. dumber. Yeah, they do. You know? <laughs> a little more asymmetrical, you know. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that makes sense. I mean, I'm hoping that uh, you know, my sons aren't gonna have at least. Well, I know my sons aren't gonna have at least one of the recessives I have. <laughs> so that'll be good. Um. And I'd be interested to see what I'll be interested to see what they turn out like. But um, I wanted to ask you another question that's sort of, again, more in the realm of like evolutionary biology and not genetics per se. But of course, you're well versed enough to be uh, to have an informed opinion on this, um, which is this question of like, for lack of a better word, like artificial versus natural selection. Right. And what I mean by that is like when you were talking to me about sort of like okay, how would, a, how would a gene for light skin, for example, perform um, in, uh, you know, in like a tropical versus uh, more, more cold climate? Um, a lot of the reasons why those, uh, you know, those variants would have been selected for or against in past human history has to do with environmental pressure, literally from the elements, right? Either from the weather or from access to food, or just basic, you know, survival. Whereas um, today, almost no people pretty much anywhere are really subject to a lot of uh, environmental, you know, cutting off of their germline, right? Uh, very few people are dying of exposure or dying of starvation pretty much anywhere, or even dying of um, of certain, like, uh, communicable diseases that would have been much more common um, before, you know, the invention of like vaccines and, uh, you know, sanitary plumbing and things like that. So do you think that there is a meaningful distinction between the people that are going to be reproducing now uh, in our environment where we where we have a lot of control over nature? And the people that were around uh, sort of like pre-modern technology, pre-modern civilization. Or do you think that this sort of like artificial versus natural distinction 
is kind of contrived and everything is just the environment. Yeah, I mean, I think at the high level, you know, to use a business startup word, uh, at the high level, uh, I think um, I'm more in the latter category, but um, the mechanism, the, you know, it, it plays out differently. <clears throat> so one thing I, I will tell you, and this is something that's like discussed in the genetic literature, um, there is a there is a level of selection uh, that actually we're not uh, we're not eliminating, and that's miscarriage. So depending on how you estimate it, like anywhere from like twenty to sixty percent of fertilizations mm-hmm. uh, end in miscarriage. Um, we don't see very much of any trisomies, like which is like you know aneuploidies, uh, except for chromosome twenty one, which is the smallest chromosome. Uh, uh, because, uh, uh, you know, um, all the other ones are too problematic and they miscarry, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so the point is um, uh, there's still selection happening at the miscarriage rate. Uh, some geneticists have argued, um, uh, <clears throat> well, it's 21, uh, sorry, second to smallest, but... Um, <clears throat> um, this is 22 autosomes. But uh, uh, the point is, um, the theory is the miscarriage rate is increasing as more and more people are not dying in their life. Mm. Right? So it's like the argument is we're shifting selection in utero. I mean, and that theory makes sense to me. Um, we are intervening in utero to also help fetuses, but... Um, we're not intervening like within the first like month and a half. Hmm. So really what's probably going to happen is a lot of it is going to be squeezed in very early in the pregnancy. Yeah. Um, where it's like women and their partners who have like more of a genetic load that live into adulthood and can reproduce are just going to have much higher miscarriage rates and they're going to have, they're, high, they're going to have a problem conceiving. We do know that the for infertility rates do seem to be increasing, including to very young ages, like something like, Ten percent um, of couples have infertility problems. How many couples? I'm just like checking out because these numbers are always uh, changing. Um, so I'm gonna check the proportions. I'm not bullshitting it. <coughs> so uh, ChatGPT is ten to fifteen percent of couples in the United States, mm-hmm. right? Um, so as as we get better at keeping like I'll use the old school word, unfit people alive in yeah. adulthood, um, we're going to have more fertility problems. Uh, another sort of like add on to this would be like, <laughs> was infant mortality a significant selection pressure in the past? Because we've eliminated um, a lot of that. Yeah, um, this is a weird thing. Infant mortality probably increased in the recent past oh. because of uh, the bad um, medicine <laughs> oh okay the atrogenics <laughs> now, yeah until until like the 20th century mm-hmm. um having a doctor might actually have increased your chance of dying right <laughs> um this is like sad and pathetic and laughable and i shouldn't laugh but you know you know what i'm saying yeah yeah so doctors were spreading disease um and uh a lot of the a lot of the uh best practices uh were, were retarded I can't say that. I mean, they were just dumb, like, uh, in terms of, like, you know, sending the infant away to wet nurses and all these other things. Um, And there was also issues, you know, and, like, for example, in Afghanistan, there's all these weird things that humans believe sometimes. Like, in Afghanistan, like, uh, when the Americans invaded, they had to change this folk thing where it's, like, you have to wash a newborn with very cold water. Okay, It was making them sick. Yeah, like they were getting chills. They're newborns. Mm. They were in ninety-eight point six degrees their whole life. They pop out into the world, and you bathe them in really cold water. Mm. Yeah, so um, infant mortality was a thing, uh, obviously, um, but it was a more it was really really bad. I think for a couple of hundred years, uh, especially with the shift towards the cities. Without germ theory, all of these other things. Cities have always been bad for infant mortality, um, from what we can tell. 
and with industrialization, all these people packed into the cities into the tenements. Hmm. So we get like a little bit of a skewed view because you know American public health and all that uh, emerged in the context of perhaps like some of the worst you know outbursts of infant mortality in our history. I think. Okay. Okay. So you're saying maybe it's overestimated how much of an influence it would have had. I mean, I'm not talking about like, you know, Spartans, like leaving their babies out to, to you know, <laughs> through exposure or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's interesting. I guess sort of one thing at the root of like the question that I asked you that sort of got us down this, this line of thinking was just this notion that civilization does have a domesticating force on the human animal. And in some ways, we are less magnificent um, than our deep ancestors, right? Like we're smaller, we have less bone density, we have smaller jaw lines. Um, and so I'm just wondering out loud whether the sort of civilizational epoch that we're in, obviously we've been domesticated for a very long time, arguably since the the advent of agriculture. Um, but whether the civilization epoch that we are in will, you know, give give rise to maybe even more domestic forms of human animals. Like you've seen those illustrations of like, you know, humans 500 years from now are going to be this like amorphous blob. They're, they're going to be, no, they're going to be a head with a butt. Yeah, right. <laughs> No, um, I think that's a fair point. I think that's true. I mean, <clears throat> so let's like analogize it maybe a little bit to the shift to agriculture. So you have the hunter gatherers. They're, I mean, they're not like the healthiest, but like they're pretty hale in a lot of ways. Um, if you look at their teeth, for example, um, they're pretty good teeth. Like what the hell? They got big teeth. They got big jaws. You know, uh, well, it's because you know they didn't eat the form of processed food that became popular with agriculture, right? So this is what you're alluding to. Um, Australian Aborigines actually still have very, very robust cells and stuff like that. You know, people used to say like, oh, it's because they're like fairly human and all that. Um, really, it's just because they never did agriculture. Yeah. So Aboriginal skulls, they look more like what European skulls look like uh, with the people in Europe that lived in Europe before agriculture. The skulls look kind of like that. Like I've, cause I've seen it. They mm -hmm. have like, they're just like, just like layered on a lot more bone. It's because their jaws, they need to like chew and stuff like that. You know, um, if they're males, they're going out. And they're doing stuff that's intense, like in terms of hunting, probably, you know? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, you know, the, and the women, like they, um, they masticated, I mean, they, you know, to create leather. They would chew. Neanderthals did that too, you know? So they did all these things by, you know, everyone was a jack of all trades. <clears throat> so... You see in the selection pressures, my friends have told me, you know, uh, bone density and all these other things. But you see in the archaeology, but you see in the genes, like our genes, like uh, I think they're called like the osteo. What is it? Anyway, genes related to bone growth, uh, bone from morphogenesis um, shift. And they change with agriculture because it's expensive. Hmm. Um, as an agriculturalist, you don't need like the intense bone. So we got more and more grass hole. That's kept going on until like the last couple of thousand years. Like we have really good data from England because they they're pretty advanced in genomics. You can see like even into the medieval period, people are getting slight, more slightly built. Okay? Mm. It's a continuous process. Basically, we're gonna get as fragile as it's physically possible <laughs> because bone growth is expensive. I guess I don't know. Okay, um, so we have changed that way. Um, our teeth, like some of it's environmental, like sugar destroys a lot of the teeth. Also, the wear and tear from you know, bits of whatever in grain. But, um, you know, you're talking about the future, but I bring it to the agriculture because the first couple of generations, though, agriculture created a sure fit of abundance. So it mm. increases your caloric output per acre by 10x, yeah. you know, from foraging. And so all of a sudden you have, like, all these resources and you have these huge families. Mm. Because hunter-gatherers tend to be um, kind of anti-natalist in terms of, like, they do spacing with weaning. Because, like, they have to kill the, they have to kill extra infants. They can't carry so many infants, right? Mm. They're they're mobile often. Um, agriculture people are much more sedentary, mostly sedentary, so they can have large families. And you know, on the frontier, like in America, you have huge families. So that probably what initially happened with agriculture. Uh, these like, all of a sudden these hunter gatherers started farming. They weren't the best farmers, but hey, they got the best land, and it's all virgin territory. 
and they have these massive families because they're not moving around, and the kids are helping out, you know. Um, I mean, I think they, I've seen some arguments that the kids helping out on the farm thing is a little overdone, but the point, though, is they're not moving around. They can't have large families, mm. you know, and they start to have, like, larger populations, specialization, all this stuff. It's great for a while, but eventually land runs out, and you hit the Malthusian trap. Right. And that's when all of these bad things, like disease and you know, dental caries and all these, really start kick in. Because all of a sudden, you've consumed all your excess surplus, and now you're on the margin. And it turns out you're stuck, right? Now you're eating this like monotonous diet. <clears throat> all of the forest or the wilderness that you were hunting in to diversify your diet is gone. Mm. And all you're doing is living off gruel. Uh, whether right. it's barley gruel, wheat gruel, rice gruel, millet gruel, that's what most of these people, most of our ancestors lived off of, gruel, right? It was like a paste often. Like sometimes you make bread, but a lot of times it's a gruel. It's like you add water, maybe if you have salt, whatever, and you make it mush it in, it's a mush. You just eat the mush, right? Mm -hmm. And like, of course, our teeth are going to be crappier. You're eating mush now. Our jaws are going to be smaller. They're not even developing. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have as much calcium now. So what are you going to be building with your bones? You know, all of this stuff is, you know, so it, it got really crappy. Um, and then we invented, well, I mean, actually, so I read a book by Michael uh, Mujikrishna. He's going to be on my podcast. But, you know, basically unlock new levels of energy, fossil fuels, all of a sudden, plentitude. Mm. And then we got big again in the 19th century, you know, and the 20th century, Haber-Bosch process, Green Revolution. <clears throat> so, um, you know, we're going through transition. And, uh, you know, are we going to go into a Malthusian trap again? Maybe. Um, this might be like the best of best of all worlds for like the next couple of decades, you know, or, um, you know, we might go to the stars and change. So I think, yeah, evolutionary pressures are going to continue, but we don't know like whether we're going to be better or worse. I think um, candidly, like transhumanism probably is going to be a thing. Mm -hmm. um, some people will be naturals. They won't want to change, but a lot of people will do cybernetics. Um, transformations. I'm um. I'm not sure about AGI, um, LLMs and stuff like that. I don't. I have like weak intuition there. <clears throat> there might be something with our white wetware that's special in a way we don't understand. So I uh, I can imagine um us maintaining our brain wetware, but getting rid of a lot of the extra stuff. You know. Like, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I yeah. I, like, I also. Like, like Alita Battle Angel, that sort of stuff. Right, right. You know? Yeah, I mean, all the Neuralink stuff, it may be, I don't know, it may be difficult to, like, make the the wetware and the hardware very compatible, um, but maybe well, not, I mean. Well, I mean, no, I think uh, I think the main issue is uh, for people that are, like, amputees and stuff, they're already working on arms. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I think, I think, like, arms and legs are going to well, just... be, like... The, the first things that are going to get replaced. I, 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 that. I guess what I mean is though, like, like, okay, so that amounts to like signal processing, right? Where I'm just sending the brain signal to input output, brain. input output. Yeah. But when we're talking about, okay, what if I try to use it to like enhance my current thinking, then you're yeah. doing it in the opposite direction. And that's a little bit <clears throat> dicier for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't think we under, we have a good, we don't have a, we don't have a really good uh, sense of what's going on there, but. Uh, so I will say about the LLMs, um, you know, I read a blog post by an LLM guy. <clears throat> he said that, you know, and he, I, I noticed this. He was like, you know, two or three years ago, he was very pessimistic about LLMs, and there was a GPT discontinuity, mm -hmm. right? And so my point here is, like, I just have, like, weak intuition now because the people who thought that they knew everything about the LLMs and were, like, projecting out were like, look, LLMs can't really do much. It's going to be decades. Yeah. And then in the last like six months, there's been like pretty much an order of magnitude shift. Now they're like, oh, well, there are reasons due to constraints that they can't really do much more. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I'm like, like, maybe. How are we not maybe, in the same place? Yeah, maybe. But like you did think that you straight up did think that three years ago or two years ago. Right. So should I really trust you? So, you know. Yeah, I mean, OK, so this is again. Probably not the best topic for uh, the the pairing on this show, but um, one of the thoughts that I've had about LLMs, I've been working with LLMs for the last three months uh, pretty intensively, 
and I knew a little bit, a good amount about NLP and stuff before that, um, is I under, my understanding is that the theory of human language is that language is primarily not for communicating with other people. And that the prevailing hypothesis is that actually the reason humans have language uh, and language that's so complex is actually for our own self-talk. If that's true, then... Yeah. If that's true, then language is sort of the basis for human reasoning or for at least externalizing our reasoning. And yeah. on that, like, just using that as a as a series of logical steps, I I don't see why an LL, why the LLMs would be any more limited than we are. But I mean, of course, they're not embodied yeah. and so forth. Like, I, I'm a big fan of George Hotz. I liked what he's doing with robotics. I do believe that to get to like anything close to AGI, it does need to be embodied, just because. Uh, you are like functioning in the world and you're interfacing with like a real physical reality. But as far as reasoning is concerned, I, I, I like that to me seems pretty, like a pretty reasonable argument that the LLMs should be able to reason just as well as we can. Maybe. I, I, yeah. I don't have much to offer to this. Okay. Not, you're, you're leading, you're leading the blind here. Well, just think about it and then maybe we can revisit it sometime. Um, yeah. Cool. I wanted to 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 sort of transition um, now to the next part of the show, which is I want to ask you about something that a lot of people don't get a chance to ask you about, just because most of the time you're talking on your own show, you're doing the interviews on something like uh, unsupervised learning or on something like Brown Pundits. But I want to ask you a little bit about your startup, Generate, because you've been working um, at Generate for a while now. You're the CXO of um, really a genomics data platform called Generate. Um, so would you mind just telling us a little bit, and I know there's Generate Podcast also has its own show, but would you mind just telling the people a little bit about what Generate's trying to do and what your vision is for the company? Yeah, I mean, I was on some Generate calls. It's like, you know, we're recording on a Sunday. I was on Generate calls today. Um, you know, as you know, uh, Generate takes up a lot of my time, my energy, uh, a lot of my focus, uh, especially during daylight hours uh, and seven days a week. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's separate from my public persona in some ways. Um, not always, though. Uh, uh, it's, it's, so what I like to say is, you know, a lot of the stuff you see in my sub stack is about the past, hmm. taking genetics and working back and inferring into the past. Generate is about the future. So as we're, like, sequencing everything um, – <coughs> we want to bring genetics into our lives. Uh, we want to allow you to screen your offspring, uh, make better choices for your life, you know, guide gene editing, um, you know, bring the genomic revolution and gene editing and genetic engineering to agriculture and have a green revolution 21st century, you know, um, the genomic green revolution. Uh, so many things we want to do. Um, sometimes some things you guys have noticed or people have started talking about and it's starting to happen in some places is a, uh, like uh, universal sequencing, uh, Yanni Verlich, geneticist in Israel now, NY, NYU geneticist, uh, as um, talk about it, go to the toilet, it's like sequences your stool every single time, hmm. right? And that will give you a sense. I mean, imagine if it detects cancer cells in your stool it's from you, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's a dream. The dream hmm. is like, you're always monitoring and like, you know, it's offloaded to some artificial intelligence and, uh, you know, you don't have to notice yourself. Cause like, you know, with cancer, a lot of times people don't understand what's happening at first and they don't go. Mm. So like say pancreatic cancer, it's often detected late and that's why more people die. You know, mm. I'm, I, I like, I know people on like two hands who close to me ish, uh, who have had pancreatic cancer. It's, it's bad. A lot of it is just like it's in the middle of your body. I get to do a biopsy. And it's just like it's not like on the surface of the skin. It's not visible. People don't know. But, you know, if the cells are in your, you know, if they're in your body, they somehow get out. I'm just saying, you know, um, that, that, that it could be detected, right? So that's the dream. How do we get there? We have to get there. Um, 
so we have all this technology. We're talking about HDNA. HDNA is paired with uh, genomics, uh, you know, and also like the biological, like the sequencing. So there's the sequencing machines. They're the awesome technology. There's the computers that are taking the data in, awesome technology. And there's the ancient DNA methodology that puts DNA that, that works into the sequencing machines to be processed by the computers. So these like three things are coming together. They don't naturally come together. Humans have to bring them together. Mm. Um, with, I believe, a lot of the stuff going on with medical health, med tech, um, we have the technology. Like, we have $200 human genomes right now. Mm. Like, you can get one, get a good medical grade human genome. Anyone can. $200, you got $200? I mean, with inflation, we're all making two hundred dollars, you know. <laughs> so that it, it, with inflation, a two hundred dollar price point, it's not what it was ten years ago, you know. Mm. So um, we have the technology, but can we do anything with it? Um, well, you know, the databases haven't come together, the machine learning algorithms haven't come together, ease of use hasn't come together. Scientists are futzing around with the algorithms, with the platforms, with the pipelines. Uh, Generate is a little piece of the puzzle. Right now, a little piece, tiny piece. To actually bring it all together and push science forward so it can become engineering and help us flourish, right? I mean, that's like, we are a tiny thing. We have a big vision, as a lot of other companies do. And we believe that all boats are rising in this field right now. So we're like a pretty chill about like competition. Not like totally chill. We are a startup, but... You know, look, this is – we're going to go from like a million to a hundred million to a billion genomes, human mm. only, like within the next 10 to 20 years. Mm. I do believe that. So we got to store that. We got to manage that. We got to have privacy. We have to have it in lockdown. And we have to be able to like get it into the flow of yeah. analysis, right? So there's a technologically driven blue ocean basically is what you're saying. Yeah, that's 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 fine. Yeah, that's the one way you can say it. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we are, you know, everything is going to be in the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you want to go to the brass tacks, we're platform agnostic. Um, we'll work with Web3. We'll work with Microsoft, Google Cloud, Azure, you know, uh, AWS, um, all that stuff to do the storage and management. And, you know, we're working on a suite of tools for analysis and understanding. And, um, you know, our ultimate goal is to like have a more modular system where researchers can robustly uh, customize their own pipeline, their own analytic tools. Uh, but like they don't. So one thing that is a thing with biologists right now is scientific software, scientific packages are not like, you know, like they don't do unit testing and all that stuff. They're not like super robust. Mm -hmm. And so once they get a pipeline to work, they never change it. But sometimes they should. A lot of times they should. Mm -hmm. But they're worried about breaking things, you know, and so we want to make it so that. You know, you know, this is like, you know, startup spiel, you know, talk, but autonomy, flexibility, you know, we give you control, all this stuff, and we want you to be sure that it's going to be robust, that you're not going to break things. Mm. That's what they're worried about, because it's just like, it's pretty fragile, you know, uh, because it's all new. Like, this whole field is 20 years max, max. Really, most of the development has been in the last 10 years, and in the last 10 years, compute and everything like that has just exploded but so has like the data size yeah right so if you go from like like in 2010 you know you would be in a lab and you'd get one genome you're like oh one genome that's like twenty thousand dollars and we're gonna get so much insight out of this one genome now you're gonna give you give, they're gonna give you a hundred genomes mm -hmm. they're gonna give you a thousand genomes so your your like scripts that were parsing one genome are they gonna scale to a hundred are you gonna do that in sequence or are you going to have to rewrite everything? You know, like all of these are – like there are some of our people that we have uh, done market research with and pilot projects. One guy has scripts uh, – Perl scripts from 2013 that he's using. And uh, it's, on, they're on, it's on his last leg, you know, 10 years old Perl scripts on their last leg, you know? Hmm. So, um, yeah, that, that's what it is. So, yeah, it generates about um, bringing life science – uh, to the masses by enabling scientists. Yeah. You know, by increasing right. scientific productivity and innovation. We're a platform. Right. You let the scientists be scientists and not, and not, and not like engineers, right? Like yeah. 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 And, you know, and candidly, you know, I read this in The Economist like 20 years ago that in 20 years, every American was going to become a systems administrator. Right. 
It's 20 right. years. Not every American is a systems administrator. You know why? Um, because we've gotten better with how we do information technology, and you don't need as many human beings doing all this management, like DevOps, you know, yeah. everything like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, abstracting away just a lot of the, the layers um, on tooling is sort of like uh, what we've been doing from the beginning in, in, <laughs> in computers. Like, <laughs> a, a developer now in some ways has to know a lot more than a developer maybe 40 or 50 years ago, but in some ways they also have to know a lot less because the level of abstraction that they're working at is so high for most of us that, uh, you know, it's not like we're down there looking at registers. Right. Um, cool. So that's sort of the, the outline of, of generate for you and really like, is there a uh, a good, um, I guess, uh, feedback loop between your public persona as, uh, you know, as a scientist and as a um, and as a you know a podcaster as a node in networks as you called yourself and what you're doing at Generate or are they like largely distinct in that they're sort of not feeding back into each other? It's not permeable. I mean. You know, people know me when I reach out to, you know, get customers and stuff like that. You know, mm -hmm. they Google me and stuff comes back. Yeah. You know? So, um, yeah, but I try to keep it. I mean, some, I think some of the customers and clients do not know who I am uh, beyond Generate. And I don't like say, like, read my Wikipedia. Yeah, things. you don't need to make a point of it, you know. No, no. But sometimes they find out. Um, it's not so, a celebrity like, endorsement. <laughs> Well, I mean, so I the last um, Generate podcast, uh, and I really enjoyed this one. I enjoyed all of them, but like I really enjoyed it with Brian Frezza of Emerald Labs, and he's an awesome now. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if he knew who I was. I don't think he did knew who I was, you know, but whatever. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and so we did the podcast about his startup journey in Emerald Labs. It's kind of like AWS uh, for lab work, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, so he did, the, he did it, and then I tweeted it out. Like, I really enjoyed this podcast with Brian Frezza. And Frezza messaged me, and he was like, oh, my God. Like, my dad's like, you're famous. Because, <laughs> like, his dad follows me on Twitter. Oh, yeah. You know? So this is, like, one of the things. Okay, like, so Frezza now mm. knows that I'm a thing besides Generate. But he didn't know, you know, because his dad, like, gave him feedback. So, uh, you know, stuff like that happens. Um, sometimes <clears throat> people I know through social media or the science world, they see I'm doing this Generate thing, and they're like, um, what is it? And then, you know, get a customer, get a client, you know? So yeah, there is a feedback loop, but, uh, I obviously, uh, I, you know, I, I have a different comportment. Like, you know, if you see me on my zoom calls and stuff like that, I mean, I'm funny and stuff like that, but, uh, um, I'm a little bit more buttoned down, you know, sure. I have a CX to generate. Um, so I try to keep it professional. Um, and then, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just be candid. Like there's some of our, one of our advisors is a friend of mine. And uh, he was like, uh, <coughs> you know, I, he's like, um, I noticed how different you are in the advisory calls. Because, <laughs> like, you know, we'll have, like, an advisory call. And, like, it's, like, me and Taylor and my co-founder and usually, uh, um, you know, a couple of other people, uh, you know, our director of science stuff. And, uh, and then, like, a couple hours later, we'll be talking on Zoom, and I'll just be talking totally different. And I'm just like, well, you know, yeah, that's, like, sure, that's just life. Sure. Like you, yeah. you, have, you have to have a different register. Yeah. Speaking of like different registers, uh, at the risk of potentially triggering you, although I think it'd be kind of a uh, good content. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your Twitter account and like, just, you know, what it's like being a public figure and having a lot of followers. Um, cause a number of people have remarked even recently that you tend to be different, a different person on Twitter than you are. Uh, in real life and in other contexts. Um, and uh, I will just give a brief uh, anecdote here that happened to me recently. So I was at an event. We were having dinner with a group of friends in my city. And one of the individuals showed up who did not know why we were all there. They were invited by some girl, whatever they show up. And he starts asking, okay, so what is this? What are all you people? How do you all know each other? And so I tell him, you know, we all know this guy named Razeev Khan. 
And wait, was I was I at this event? No, you were not. You were not. This happened while you while you were uh, somewhere else. Um, and he goes, "Oh, I don't really follow this person, but I know of him on Twitter. Like I see him tweeting, and the way that he talked about it gave me the impression that he was like not. <laughs> he didn't get the best, you know. Uh, you didn't put the best foot forward in terms of your presentation. He said his tweets occasionally come on my timeline." Um, and you know, whatever. And so, you know, I sort of like continue to talk about it. And I was like, well, you know, everybody that's here kind of knows this person, whatever. And, uh, this has been remarked upon. And I know like the other day you sort of went on a little bit of a rant, uh, on Twitter and you occasionally have these, you know, uh, for lack of a better term outbursts. <laughs> so I just wanted to ask you like, um, how, how do you think about it now that you're more popular on Twitter? I mean, when I first encountered you, I think you had about 20,000 followers and now I think you're somewhere around 60,000. And I bet that assuming your brand I was a, continues, I, was a, I was, I think I was at 15, but yeah, yeah maybe, maybe somewhere around there. Like I know a lot of posters in the tens of thousands, right. In the low tens, like 10, 20,000 followers. There are a lot of people I know who nobody knows who they are that have 10 or 20,000 followers. Right. Um, but once you're at like 50,000 and up, especially once you get to a hundred thousand, then really you're, you're kind of becoming a public figure. Right. And I see that sort of happening to you. You're at the stage in your career where you are kind of becoming a public figure. And I know you have some other things in the works, some other podcasts that you might be going on very soon, um, that stand to really amplify your presence. Right. So well, how do I you, mean, so how do you well, just I mean, think like, about filtering all that noise? Yeah. Well, so people like want to come on my podcast now, you know, um, that, that, you know, people who, uh, it's cause they saw you on red scare, right? No, it's not even the red scare. Like people whose names might, you know, names might rhyme with Hawkins, you know, people like that. So, yeah, you know, right. you know, so it's like, uh, so I think some of it's auto catalytic, like the bigger you get, the bigger you get, you know, mm -hmm. your attention, people just like start to, um, you know, and I've been like, canceled a bunch of times and that's like a problem for some people but you know once you're on coleman hughes and red scare like people are just like okay whatever you know so that's part of it i think it's just like i've i've overwhelmed uh i've flooded the zone um and overwhelmed their worries you know mm -hmm. so that's one thing they just need they need a hook um you know i'm uh as far as my twitter persona i probably should tone it down sometimes but like i mean like what are you gonna do like i have like like, candidly, I have, like, lots of Substack subscribers, like, you know, it's like, you can't, like, call my boss, I am my boss, you know? Sure. Uh, and so, they can't really do anything as far as, like, social ostracism, like, I have lots of friends, as you know, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm pretty fine with culling them, you know? Like, I have too many. Like, I need to do a little culling, you know? <laughs> but, uh, so this could sound weird, like someone's going to take it out of context, but you know, it's true. Yeah. You know? So it's like, I don't really give a shit if some random person who thinks like, oh, like whatever. I mean, they're probably like not worth my time anyway. Most does people it, aren't. Does it get to you or are you just like shit posting? I, no, it doesn't really get to me. I mean, like when I say that I hate most of you and I tweet that out, that's kind of true. I'm a very like I'm a really congenial person, but, but maybe it's not the best thing for your public image. That's all I'm saying. I just I just don't think much of most people, you know. Sure, sure. So it's like when they reply to me, I'm just like, you know, like you know, it's you should have high quality replies. Like if I see you reply and I'm annoyed, I might just block you. You know. Well, I guess what I'm saying though is like if I had never encountered you before, and this is <sighs> my first. If I saw someone's timeline like that, I maybe would not have followed you in the first place. Yeah, maybe, I mean, maybe you not. don't care. Maybe you don't care. Yeah, I, don't know. I don't care. Like I have like you know like I have like forty thousand people on my email list. You know, sure. Like I have you know like I've had like you know I've had tens of millions of people read me. You know, mm. so it's not like I'm just a Twitter person. Like I have a Substack. I have several blogs. I have a YouTube ch channel that like is from my podcast. Uh, I have like two science podcasts science-ish podcasts 
and I have the Brown Pundits podcast. Uh, so like, yeah, I have like many, many different channels that I use. So just you know, Twitter's like, whatever. I don't, or X. I don't know how long it's gonna be around. Yeah, sorry, yeah. X. Yeah, I don't know how long it's gonna be around, but I mean, I mean, part of it is like you know, I I have like a lot of scientist followers, but I have a lot of like tech people. And um, I started finally following Anons a little bit, a little bit, you know, really high quality ones. Um, but you know, uh, Anons, I I'm assume I assume some of them are are uh, great people. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's, it's a prior issue, you know. It's like uh, you know, most of them are trash, you know. So uh, I have a high threshold. Like, if you have like a real name, I'm probably less likely to block you, like for annoyance. You know, everyone has like an implicit who you follow back, who you engage with, and stuff like that. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of it is like you know, like let's say like you know, you know my ideology. I'm right wing person, for sure. example. So a lot of people they're right wing like me, and they think, oh well, you know, Rizzi would like me because I'm right wing, and I'm like, no, you're stupid. No offense, you're stupid. I don't want I don't want to hear you know. So like that's a, a huge problem where people feel like. Oh, he's right wing, or he's a brown guy, or he's an atheist. Like whatever identity they want to like ascribe to me, they're like, "Oh, we'll have like, like no, if you're stupid, I don't want to talk to you." Just how it is. <laughs> I'm just sorry. I mean, like maybe we can talk about sports or something. You know what I'm saying? But like, no, I I don't want I don't want I don't want your ideas coming at me. They're not going to be interesting. You should consume people's ideas. You should not produce anything of your own. Hmm. You have no skill. You are not a craftsman. You know? so, so, yeah. I mean, I think um, there's a there's always a tension where, like, if you believe in human hierarchies, then uh, you just have to acknowledge that people have their different uh, different places, right? And no, uh, it's like I'm not I'm not I'm not posting my paintings. I'm not tweeting my paintings. Yeah, I can't paint. Right. I'm not, I'm not posting my, like, songs because I can't sing. Mm -hmm. So, like, why are you giving me your ideas when you can't ideate? <laughs> they don't know that. No one's told them. <laughs> I mean, I do. Yeah, right. Like, I mean, I used to, back in the day, I used to be, like, more polite. I'd be like, I, I don't think you should reply to me. I don't think you're very smart. Mm. And that didn't usually go down well. So now I just block people. Yeah, I guess... I I don't run into that issue very much. I'm not a very popular account, but I'm assuming it will happen eventually. I the mean, only look, place, also, the only place where I get a lot of stupid comments are on the YouTube comments. Um, no, you, but YouTube is like next level retard. Yeah, but that's the only place where I see it on a regular basis. I mean, on Twitter, they're typing. This is like yeah. actually selecting for a higher level of mental caliber. On sure. YouTube, yeah, they're typing, but they're like video. They're visual thinkers. Right. They right. don't think. <laughs> Yeah. Like you, you, I don't read comments on YouTube. They are bad. They are dumb. But um, I mean, I I think like you know, in terms of Twitter, um, like you know, people are like, oh, you're being dumped by like BAP and shit like that. Like, I don't give a shit. I don't think you're I'm being dumped by BAP. <laughs> no, no, dumped. No, no, I'm saying I'm like okay, so no, but like, I know like, about I the feud. I know about the feud between you and the frogs. I will just say this: the smarter, more sophisticated ones, which are generally the bigger accounts are not engaging in whatever the stupid fake fight is that's happening. All right. Yeah, I know, all. I know. All I'm trying to say is like people are like, you know, cause I have a lot of friends like the right wing space. They're like, Oh, did you see some like retarded person dunked on you? And like, they don't say retarded person, but I'm like, you're talking about a retarded person. Like I think less of you that you think that's amusing. Yeah. Well, I, I just, I know some of them are going to come after me for even posting this interview. So I'm like anticipating it. I'm like getting ready. Yeah. I mean, but they're like, they're, they're subhuman animals. They swarm. They're yeah. like, uh, they're like, they're going to uh, be like, they're, they're like, going to be like, Mershak, you interviewed a Brown <laughs> and I'll be like, uh, they're like, they're like, they're like, you know what? They're do like, you know they're what like my larva. name is? Do you know my name? They're, they're, they're like larva. They're like black soldier flies. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like right. they're like, they're like low level composters. Yeah. You know? So it's like, oh, like this, like, um, some like frog was like saying, oh, like, 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 um, you know, like, um, find a toilet to shit in. And I'm like, well, you should go to the toilet because that's what you need to eat. Yeah, because, I saw like, that. I saw that exchange. Yeah. I, <laughs> like, and he didn't really have much to come back. I thought. To. I thought it was a little, <laughs> he, he a little was much. Dumb, you know, on, like, on all yeah, sides. Like, those motherfuckers that come at me, and I'm like, I don't give a shit because, like, I think you're subhuman because, like, there's a human hierarchy and you're below me. 
you know, which they believe. But I, then when they're told that they're stupid, yeah, then they like they, then then they like they like they like you know freak out because they don't want to be told that. But like, look, you're an anon on the internet. Yeah, I'm sure some of you have regular jobs, but you're also you know like we have you know mutual friend for example. He's in like a bunch of group chats. I don't think he's gonna listen to this, so I can just well, I mean, I would say this to his face, but it's just like oh, like he's in with like they're successful people. But, like, they're in a group chats anonymously expressing their opinions. Oh, great. Why do I give a shit? You have $10 million? If I had $10 million to my name, would I be, like, skulking around anonymously? No. Like, I've spoken with my name, my real name, the whole time on the internet. So, like, don't fucking, like, talk to me about how this is, like, a successful person. Like, you got money, but is that success? Is that success? Is that the measure of who you are? Coward? Like, you got a big mansion? Big McMansion and you're an anonymous coward on the internet. You think I should be? You think I should be impressed by that? I'm not impressed by that. You know, just yeah. Not. You know, yeah. like we go, like everyone, everyone's gonna turn into dust. Um, and you know, if you have children, which most of these, like a lot of these losers do, don't. But if you have children, you have to like tell them like who you were as a human being in this life. And if you made a shit ton of money and you were a coward, that's who you were. That is what your children will know you as. So. Keep it real, you know? Um, and I understand, like, you know, like this is the example I give. If you're a dissident in Iran, be anonymous. Or if you're, like, in a big corporation, they're doing some shady thing, and you're trying to, like, there are reasons that anonymity has to be there. The issue is, like, always when people abuse it, you know? And so they use it to, like, be their worst selves, uh, pose, and all these other things. Here's another thing that's really amusing. Um, you know, because I've been, like, blogging for 20 years, and people will be, like, you know, they'll be, like, reply. They're, like, this is, like, my idea. And I'm, like, yeah, I think it's dumb. And they're, like, well, you don't know how credentialed I am. And I'm, like, you're reading oh, me. I, I'm I not hate, reading I you. hate that argument. I hate. I had a philosopher do that to me. He tried to pull the credential card. He's, like, like he, he, we were arguing. We were having an argument on Twitter, right? I'm under my real name, okay, buddy? He's an Anon, an Anon philosopher. And then I start arguing with him in public. He DMs me. He's, like. I can't believe you would disrespect me like this and then try to embarrass me in front of everybody, blah, 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 blah. And then I get, I get other DMS from other philosophers that are like, if you knew who this guy was, you wouldn't be doing this, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, bitch, I don't know who he is because he doesn't tell me like, <laughs> what, why? I don't care who you are. Like, why don't you just stand on the strength of your arguments? That's the issue. What is your work product? What is your work product now? And that's actually what I like about the startup world. Um, academia is not totally bad. I don't want to totally shit on it, but it has that problem where it's like who you are, what your pedigree is, et cetera, et cetera, matters a lot in terms of the yeah. rating. And I understand why it has to be like that. In the startup world, though, who knows? Some high school student could have the best idea. You know? Yeah. It's just That's just how it is. And that's how it's been, actually, in the past. So... Um, I know that it's really frustrating to academics and like people in more from more corporate backgrounds, but you know you need to have this. You need to have this, you know, ability for people without credentials. Sometimes they have the most innovative ideas because they've not been in the system. They see outside the box. That's cliche, but it is true, you know. So yeah, yeah. I mean, when when people engage in this sort of like credential or like you know, do you know who I am and and stuff like that. Like sometimes I will say, look. I do know about this, but it's too complicated for me to explain, so I'm just going to exit. Mm. You know, that's that's what you have to do. Because sometimes, yeah, like, people, they don't know. They're trying to make a good faith effort, but it's just, like, this is just too much of a lift, especially on Twitter. Like, a lot of times I say, this is Twitter, I'm not. Like, I have a place where I write 5,000-word essays. This is Twitter. So yeah. uh, Twitter is more, like, about illustrating, performing, uh, expressing than actually, like, in my from, for me – we're actually like putting out an, an argument out there but um i also engage i have like a lot of different uh, i have like a pretty wide range of people who follow me and so like that's always like difficult like i you know i have like the far right frog type people who continuously cause, and i don't mind if i don't care if they consume my content i just don't want them to reply to me because usually they're not smart well there's been a, there's been an influx of dummies that's part of the problem i will just say that and the dummies are more vocal. But, you know, but, and then I have, like, scientists, historians, and scholars. I have a lot of conservative journalists, non-conservative journalists. Like, I produce a, a wide range of content. And so it's it's always, like, a difficult – I mean, I'm sure that some of my more staid followers are a little surprised by uh, – like, I mean, I come at people, you know? But then also, like, 
<laughs> Actually, so my friend Leighton Woodhouse, I had lunch with him in SF in Oakland recently. Uh, and uh, Leighton's, uh, he's got, he's at Public on Substack, and he's done a lot of like mostly liberal left wing journalism. But you know, he's, I think he's post left now more. But in any case, he said that sometimes my Twitter feed is like a cross between a scholar and a 15 year old girl because I'll post selfies and stuff like that and food. And, uh, you know, whatever, it's Twitter. I mean, it's just Commenting like on the whatever podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, if I get on that podcast, I get a whole new whole new audience, right? So when, cause when I went on the Coleman show, I got like, a lot of uh, older, older, like, um, uh, you know, older, lib- like anti-woke liberals, for example. Okay. When I yeah. went on, when I went on Red Scare, it was mostly young, non-woke women you know so it's like there's different demographics that have been exposed to me you know i mean my this is my personal opinion you don't have to agree is that there's a there's an issue right now with like internecine right online fighting which has to do with like uh confusion of like friend enemy distinctions that's all i'll say on it um uh, okay it's just like I, I just feel like some people are going way harder at each other than they need to because they're mostly it's sort of like the narcissism of small differences. Like they're mostly in agreement except on like one or two points. But for whatever reason, they're not like as aggro towards people that are totally like opposed to their, you know I mean this is a left political thing. project, right? I mean, all of these all of these online factions, when you, they don't have real skin in the the game, it's really abstract, you know? Yeah. I mean, also, like, you know, one of my friends that you know and also know, it's like, you know, we're both about the same age, and we've both been like, you know, well, he's more involved in politics than I am. I'm not really a political person, but it's like, you know, when you're, like, 25, you're like, oh, like, there, you know, there's a lot of people's front of Judea versus Judean people's front. For those of you who, you know, Google Life of Brian and what, what that reference yeah. is, but it's like, narcissism, a small difference is a big thing in your 20s, and then when you're, like, get older, you're just like, whatever, man, you know? I mean, it's just like sometimes, yeah, you have to like punch left and punch right or whatever you got to do, but you just gotta try to like you gotta win, you gotta go forward, elucidate what you believe in, and move forward. So I think that there's a, there's that issue, and a lot of it's just maturity because some of these people are very young, uh, they're very green. I mean, I run into people like at parties who are young, and they're like, "Do you know so and so?" Uh, and I was like, no, I know so and so, who I influenced, who influenced so and so, who influenced so and so, because they're like twenty, you know. Yeah. So there's been like a sequence of evolution of like thinking and engaging, and over twenty years, you know, it's percolated, and so you have these situations where it's like they don't really know, or like you know, you know, like some guy in Clubhouse was like, was like, someone was like, you know, he was twenty and he was like. You're not a paleo conservative, and I'm just like, well, I'm listed as one on Wikipedia. And Pat Buchanan mentioned me in his book as one. And so he was like, oh, you know, but he was like 20. He had no idea, you know. Like all he knew was like YouTubers, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. part of his medium is a message issue where it's like they don't really read. Like this is like a different issue, but like Zoomers, they quite clearly are less literate. Like just functionally, like they they get everything from like these like you know content creators and Ben Shapiro knockoffs you know yeah um you know what i'm saying i uh, yeah i know like, what you're talking you know about. that are monologuing and yeah. so it's like it's a different way so they but they don't know the old because like ben shapiro is not always gonna like drop the i don't know like russell kirk or or burnham or whatever i mean he'll mention but you know no i mean he's I, he's catering to a much more plebeian audience yeah and, and he's super successful at it but um, it, it means that there's like a lot of history and a lot of context that's being stripped out. Mm, okay. Well, this has been great, Razib. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Before we go, uh, where can people find you? Drop all the links and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think number one place is go to Razib.com. Uh, my substack's now at Razibcon.com. Um, my Twitter also, you know, at Razibcon. Um, I think those are the primary places. Uh yeah, I and mean, just go to resume.com. You'll see all the podcast links and everything like that. Uh, if you want to contact me, I mean, I even have a public email there. Um, I do check it like every two days or so. So, all right. Well, there you go. Thank you.